Hello once again, Sim. How are you doing? Oh, I'm good, thanks. Yeah, how are you? Good, good, good. I am not bad. Um, I have a question for you based on what we were talking about off camera, and it was mainly about fitting in. Um, you and I have been through that whole situation when you're quite young and you're watching whatever it is, it might be like, say, Saved by the Bell or some teenage <laughs> program, right? And you're looking for you in there at some point, like anyone would. Um, but obviously these programs are mainly uh, focused on the white heterosexual male or the white heterosexual female. Um, and when it comes to people who look like you and me, we're often side characters. Um, can you tell me about some of your tribulations in trying to find something that would represent how you were when you were younger and where that may have led? Yeah, I remember, you know, going into school and, and kind of being the only kid that wore a turban, you know. <clears throat> so I kind of, you know, make myself sick in the mornings, you know, so I didn't have to go to school. Um, or I make myself, sometimes I used to sort of like bang my head against the wall in the playground, you know, so I should just sort of come home because I, I always felt like, um, you know, you'd go in and there wouldn't be anyone who was like you and everyone would be talking, you know, about what, say, what, what they'd watched on TV the night before, you know, and, and it felt like they had a connection to the culture, you know, obviously, because they were part of it that I just didn't have, you know, and so I'd be going home and having a completely different experience, you know, eating different kind of food, you know, my parents would be talking in a different language, they would be talking in English, um, you know, and, and then, and then, yeah, like, you'd be sort of looking for yourself on the television. Uh, and I think, you know, obviously, when I was a kid, I wasn't watching anything particularly developed. But I think, you know, there was a seat guy who used to deliver the post in East Enders or something. You know, he had a non-speaking part, you know, and, and, and that was kind of it, really. I mean, again, you know, like films and stuff, I suppose, you know, there was there were some films in the early 90s that were kind of that I watched that were sort of, you know, about black culture and stuff. Yeah, it was, it was important for me, you know, to, to try and kind of change the stereotype around being Indian, you know, because I think there are, you know, there are loads of people who are Indian who want to, who want to be actors, who want to be musicians, who want to work in fashion, who, you know, there aren't any Indian footballers either, you know what I mean, you know, have you noticed that? Honestly, I don't follow football, you're talking to the <laughs> one person, um, I would like to assume that there are people in there, but again, that's that whole bias of thinking, well, the world has actually got like opportunities for you if you like work really hard, but let's face yeah. it, there are barriers there, and when you say there aren't any Indian footballers, I can't think of one that pops into my head, in terms of like one of those maybe uh, big celebrity type ones, because I don't yeah. know, it's, it's been ages since I watched um, football. I think the last time I watched it was the World Cup, so I, I'm that person. And I didn't see any Asian ones that were playing for England, but I could be completely wrong. Well, I mean, even when I was growing up, you know, um, oh, there were very yeah. few black footballers, you know. I mean, very few. So it was, it, was, it, was, it was, anyway, it was really different, you know, when I was growing up. I mean, I think, you know, as a Liverpool fan, John Barnes was the first black player to play for Liverpool, and he came in 1987, you know. I mean, that's yeah, 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 fair. Pretty bad, really. Um, so I, um, yeah, you are, you're looking for yourself, you know, and I guess ultimately you don't find yourself, do you? So when you can't find yourself, you have to create another character. You have to become a different person that you think maybe you can find, or you just have to get so out of your mind that trying to find the character you're trying to find becomes so impossible that you forget about trying to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah you're lost that you forget what you're looking for anyway. You know? so, there are um, people who watch this who don't understand um, the kind of damage that we went through, mainly because they were arguably part of a culture where it wasn't asking to figure out these questions or dismantle why what they were seeing was created the way it was. Um, what would you say to those people, if at all, uh, you had the chance to talk to them? Well, it's difficult because, you know, when, when, when one's talking about issues like this, you know, there's, there's fine lines, aren't there? I, I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm, 
I'm desperately trying not to come across as a, as a victim of society, like, you know, because I think, you know, I had a struggle around race, I had a struggle around kind of my identity, I had, you know, struggles with drugs, I had, I had struggles with money, I've had loads of different struggles in my life, you know, and I think everybody does have loads of different struggles and it's all relative to them, you know. But, but I think the more, the more dialogue that can go on about, you know, if you're talking specifically about racial struggles and the difficulty of people of colour trying to, you know, um, fit into society, you know, I think the more open we can, the more open conversation that we can have about it, you know, without necessarily trying to lecture someone, you know, in a social situation or inform them or go, do you know what a terrible time I had? I think the more kind of, yeah, conversation we can have, the more, you know, it can open up the idea of change. And I think music is a really powerful vessel for this. And I think, yeah. it's, I think it's more important than ever that it's used for, the, for this kind of change, really, you know, yeah. to try and bring about this kind of change, you know. Um, but, you know, do, do people change? I think you can change. I think anyone can change, really. I mean, you know, my mum was brought up to be quite racist, you know. And that's the other thing, you know. There's a lot of racism in Indian culture towards people who aren't Indian, you know, so it's not like as a culture we were just persecuted and, you know, we were, you know, I'm saying there's, there's, there's mass racism within Asian culture as well, you know, so, so anyway, you know, my mum was brought up like that and she's not like that, you know, she hasn't gone and undergone any kind of mass sort of, you know, sort of, uh, she didn't go on a course or anything, you know. Yeah. But I guess ultimately it's, you know, you have to delve within yourself and try and establish what's right and what's wrong, you know? Yeah, yeah. There's so many different things to unpack there. The main thing that I'll take from it is this, that ultimately people who don't understand the situation never had to have um, a parent talk them through what it is that led you to hitting your head against the wall. And even then, you may not necessarily have known exactly what it is you were going through until many years later. And even then, a conversation may not necessarily happen. Um, and even more to that point, I mean, we, as we were saying off camera, we seem to need to have this idea of where we are in relation to other people. It's not necessarily the weirdest thing to go to school and know that there's going to be arguably those who are um, intellectually in a certain place and so therefore they are maybe shunned by the more popular kids. Those who are... Um, physically more able are going to have a certain amount of power within their circles and so therefore if you're looking at growing up in like uh, the mid to early 80s or early 90s race is going to play its part you know I remember there was um, and I don't remember exactly his name I don't think it'd be good to say his name but there was a kid who had a turban I remember people would take the piss out of him um, and consequently he became quite a joker his defense mechanism was to use humor so that he could deflect people having to assault his personality via taking his identity, you know, cosmetically and using that as a weapon against him. Um, so if you're going to go through a situation where you have to swap out one way of looking for another so you can deflect yourself, that's, you know, that, that's a common problem from back in the day. That will obviously affect the decisions that you make in your early 20s, moving into 30s and whatnot, you know, the people around you. Um, what would you have to say about all this? I'm talking quite a lot for an interview. Oh. You must say stuff. <laughs> I, 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 do, I, I do remember thinking, you know, that I'd done something in my previous life and therefore it was a kind of like a punishment you know, of some kind, you know. And I do, um, and I do remember thinking, you know, um, that, that, I, that I'd kind of do anything to be kind of normal. I think it's that... that you know, whatever, you know, normal is. I know it, it's, 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 it's an arbitrary word, it doesn't mean anything, but I'm mean, thinking of the, I'm trying to sort of relate to the thought process of a five-year-old child, you know. Um, yeah, and, and I, guess, I guess maybe, you know, it'd be interesting to find out a little bit more about um, how, how people who, who, who for, for the work that I've done, done around myself to do with drink and drugs, I know that a lot of children feel like that at that age, regardless of the colour of their skin.
but that's kind of in the context of people who basically have the kind of um, beginnings of mental illness, you know, if you consider addiction to be a mental illness. So it would be quite interesting to know what the thought process is of a kid, four or five, you know, who, who doesn't have any mental health issues, doesn't have any disabilities, you know, isn't a person of colour, doesn't have any financial difficulties, because that was kind of thrown into it. My parents had loads of financial difficulties, you know. Yeah. And so I felt like I wasn't safe at school and I wasn't safe at home either, you know. But I mean, so it'd be quite interesting to know, you know, how much of it is, is kind of, you know, these neuroses that you have as a child, you know, which you, you kind of think of a child as being this pure, innocent, kind of free uh, being, you know, how much, how, how much, you know, how much that's just normal, you know, normal process. I mean, I know for sure the extent that I felt it, I'm sure you did as well. It's not normal, but I just wondered, you know, maybe, you know, it'd be interesting to know, wouldn't it? Um, oh, definitely. I think the main thing to, to really take from that is the kid wants to feel that they're loved and that they can be safe, right? And yeah. so if you've got every other TV program showing them how they can be safe and how they can be loved, and it's going through the lens of them being um, Caucasian, if they're not Caucasian, how do they deal with that social pressure? You know, there's certain values and, and mannerisms and... Uh, wants and motivations will be very very um askew if what's coming at them is from um you know quote unquote normal world right it, it's not addressing you it's not talking to you and so for you to yeah. feel a certain kind of comfort zone you're going to try and shave off the things which don't allow you to fit within that um that that shape you know so i'm using lots of metaphors crossing them over awesome. um, but, I, really, I really like that new idols song actually you know i want to be loved everybody does yeah that, i think it's their not their last single their latest single but the one before yeah i thought that was their best song There's, it wasn't like heavy sort of uh you know it wasn't heavy guitars and everything but i thought it was just totally beautiful and kind of you know with very um just the lyrics, I thought, yeah, I mean, they're quite, they're simple, but they're so poignant. I was just like, yeah, that's really great. Yeah, I really liked it anyway. It just made me think of that when you yeah, said Yeah, no, that. fair enough. They're, they're definitely one of those bands where they have got that whole idea right in regards to what's going on um, with matters of race and how to not step away from the conversation. Um, yeah, there's so much to be said there. Um, there's something that we spoke about um, off camera, which I want to bring again briefly before we wrap up. Um, you were talking about your love of Basquiat. Um, yeah. Uh, and, well, graffiti artist for many. And we were talking also about your, your love of Oscar Wilde. Um, and it was interesting how you framed Oscar Wilde as being um, from a world of intellectualism, whereas Basquiat's art was more guttural. Um, and yet... Um, it's, it's amazing how these two different artists uh, can actually be framed in, in ways which we may not even seemingly do it consciously, but we're giving Oscar Wilde this platform of intellectualism. Um, whereas Basquiat is just as intellectual, except these are the kinds of uh, constrictions that we find when we talk about these artists. I mean, you talk about Dostoevsky in the same way. And, and you were talking about uh, Bukowski in the same way as you were talking about Basquiat. Now, obviously, Basquiat and Bukowski are two different uh, races, obviously, race the construct. But you see what I'm saying? Um, we, we afford these different worlds, different ways of, of promoting them. And I just wanted to you know, pick your brain about that a bit more. Why, why do we do this? And, and why do we not uh, see them on the same platform, really? They may be doing different subjects, but... It's yeah. all intellectualism. Well, I suppose it's like, it's like you've got like the clash, don't you? And then you've got like Mozart, you know, who are, you know, I, I, I haven't really seen Mozart do any interviews, you know, but I know Joe Strummer was a, you know, very intelligent man, you know, but the music and the ideas are sort of, you know, um, manifest in a different way, you know, there's, you know, clash of really sort of guttural, you know, spontaneous slap you in the face, uh, you know, the very sort of political message 
you know, and, and, and Mozart, well, I don't really know too much about him, but you know what I mean? You wouldn't put it in the same, you know, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't, you know, put them together necessarily, but, you know, they, they are, and I, I sort of feel with, with Basquiat, I kind of, um, yeah, I love that kind of graffiti style, I love that kind of street art, I love kind of, you know, the stuff that he, he talks about, you know, is a lot of his work's based in that kind of, ideas around segregation and um yeah i love this spontaneity you know and but with, with kind of you know oscar wilde you know I, I was saying kind of off camera that he is considered this kind of intellectual kind of highbrow sort of you know his writing is really really beautiful but you know in lots of ways what he stood for is kind of more sort of uh superficial like it's more vacuous in the sense that you know um he was part of that kind of movement of aestheticism, you know, where like, you know, beauty and pleasure are the kind of, you know, essence of the art, you know, and it's not really anything more than that, you know, there's no, we're not, you know, they're not, they're, there's nothing political or socio-political about the work necessarily, overtly, you know, but it's about maybe, being... Yeah, maybe not overtly, but um, I, I can't help but think of bringing in another example of what I'm talking about, Andy Warhol. Um, yeah. We think of him in pop culture as being this aloof, um, distant intellectual. We afford him the idea of considering what he's doing before he commits it to canvas. We don't seem to do the same thing for Basquiat, even though, you know your history, Andy Warhol and Basquiat's um, mm -hmm. career, they're entwined. I believe that we're and I think Basquiat was kind of railing against the same thing. We're in a situation where we don't really want to afford intellectualism to Basquiat as readily as Andy Warhol because it disrupts how we want to see a particular kind of artist. Now, Basquiat didn't want to be seen as a black artist. He wanted to be seen as an artist. And that, I think, really contributed to a lot of his own issues. Um, Andy Warhol didn't necessarily have to go against um, that expectation um, he, just because of what he looked like and the way he held himself. Uh, Basquiat yeah. would afford himself um, those postures within photographs of him and the way he tried to communicate because he's trying to appeal to a certain gallery, yeah? Um, and I can't help but feel that you and I go through the same, same shit, basically. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, as, as much as people may want to afford what perhaps you may do, as guttural or um, inspired by something which is guttural. It takes time for you to mix those tracks, right, man? It takes time for you yeah, to yeah, come up yeah. with those fucking lyrics. You're not just like yeah. throwing it at the canvas. Oh, of course, yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's what I mean, you know, that, that's what I mean. Come sit down next year as you try and get the snare drum right for two hours and tell, yeah, them, yeah. tell you that you're being guttural, you know what I mean? <laughs> well, that's what I mean, kind of, when I was sort of kind of maybe weirdly talking about the clash and Mozart, you know, is that, yeah, they seem, one seems a lot more considered than the other, but it's not really the truth, is it? It's the manifestation of the internal philosophy and the spirit of the person, you know, that comes out in different ways. And I, I, I like the way that me as a person and the music and the art that I've curated is from this kind of seemingly kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, opposing, um, feelings and spirits and ideas and yeah I mean Bukowski is kind of you know his writing is completely different to Dostoevsky's you know what I mean you know but I, it feels like it's come, come from, from a completely different world you know mm. but I think it's important to kind of you know you know for me you know that that's where all my lyrics come from really is from reading I don't think I'd I don't think I'd be able to articulate anything if I didn't read so much you know and, and I, I guess I was sort of inspired by Bowie you know mm. It's a bit like Bowie and Lou Reed, isn't it? I mean, they're, they're almost the same, but Lou Reed always feels like he's a bit more guttural than Bowie. You know, Bowie feels like he's more sort of ethereal and flamboyant and mystical. But that's, that's Bowie's PR, isn't it? That's his way of oh, yeah. communicating. I mean, I think of you as an intellectual. The only issue that might be for others is because there is no, um, in their mind, precedence for someone who looks like you to be doing the complex ideas that you have yeah. on their spectrum. You know, they'll have to go to Bowie in terms of their mindset, or Lou Reed, you know? Um, like the only um, pop cultural uh, musician of great, say, significance from back in the day, I can think of would probably be Ravi Shankar, 
but how many transgressive things did Ravi Shankar say that stayed within pop culture for us to reiterate in our forums online or in yeah. an interview like this? Maybe he did a lot, but for some reason it hasn't been logged as so, unless you're talking about uh, George um, Harrison or you're talking about John Lennon and their connection uh, to this man. So, you know, it's, it, I, I definitely see what you're doing as not just guttural, but intellectual and definitely something that people should be checking out. Um, oh, so you, at, at the risk of being a raging capitalist on your behalf, where can people buy your music? <laughs> right, yeah. So there should be a link up with the interview, uh, you know, to, to link to all the streaming platforms, Spotify, iTunes, etc. And uh, uh, the album available in October will be available in all good record shops, you know, Rough Trade, and all independent record shops. And um, you know, there should be a link as well to buy, to pre-order the vinyl. Um, so yeah, yeah. Awesome. I like it, you know. <laughs> well, yeah, I've listened to it. I loved it. I feel uh, quite cheeky that other people may not have at this point. Or well, if it has come out at this point, then great, good for you. Keep spinning that record or playing it. It's all digital now. Thank you, Sim. You Thank rock. You. Have a good one. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.